Mac first team with both players also garnering all region honors. Additionally, Webb was tabbed as an honorable mention All-American by the American Volleyball Coaches Association. Meanwhile, four-time all-conference selection Meg Neon finished her career in the top 10 at WNL in both kills and digs, and Courtney Berry and Anna Soroka also received all ODAC recognition. The men's soccer team also claimed the ODAC crown, securing the program's fifth championship overall and its first since 2015. The Generals won the regular season title outright, putting together a 9-0-1 league mark and earning home field advantage in the conference tournament, which WNL capitalized upon with a 3-0 victory over Bridgewater in the ODAC final at Watt Field. The Generals then made their fourth straight appearance in the NCAA tournament, falling on penalty kicks to Johns Hopkins after a scoreless draw in the first round in Grantham, Pennsylvania. WNL finished the year with a 14-3-2 overall record. Dylan Rich, who set the program record for assist and finished third all-time in points, was named the Conference Player of the Year for the second time in his career, while Jack Rollins earned the ODAC Rookie of the Year award, and Mike Singleton was honored as Coach of the Year. Will Hamrica, Oliver Dolberg, Victor Dolberg, Will Rousen, Jack Miller, and Michael Nick also received all-conference laurels, while Rich, Rollins, and Oliver Dolberg were tabbed all South Atlantic region. Women's soccer endured a season full of near misses to finish 9-5-2 overall and 6-3-1 in the ODAC. All three of the Generals' conference losses came by a single goal, and WNL would cap off the year with a heartbreaking 2-1 double overtime road defeat against eventual conference champion and NCAA quarterfinalist Lynchburg. Megan England, who won the Conference Player of the Year award as a sophomore, produced a 27-point senior season en route to first-team All-ODAC and second-team All-Region accolades. Aaron Hay joined England on the All-Conference first team, while Caroline Peters, Sydney Von Rosenberg, Caroline Coppinger, and Kristen Castle also received All-ODAC honors. Women's Cross Country won its fourth consecutive ODAC title, placing four runners in the top nine to hold off Lynchburg at the conference meet in Winchester. Samantha Yates finished as the individual runner-up, followed by Katie Barrup in fourth place and Maggie Siebold in fifth as all three generals landed on the All-ODAC first team. Meanwhile, Julia Moody and Sarah Holland also garnered all-conference honors. WNL then placed third at the NCAA South Southeast Regional in Georgia, where Yates missed out on qualifying for the national championship by just one spot. Yates, Siebold, Barrup, and Moody all earned all-region laurels, Holland was named ODAC Rookie of the Year, and Mike Dager received the conference's Coach of the Year award. The men's cross-country team also claimed the conference championship for the fourth straight season, coming in 60 points ahead of runner-up Lynchburg at the ODAC meet. Alex Dolwick placed second overall in Winchester, followed closely by fellow first-team all-conference Harriers Hank Patrick, Austin Kinney, and Ethan Bernstein. Daniel Cope and Freddie Marks also grabbed all ODAC honors, while Patrick was named the Conference Scholar Athlete of the Year for the second straight season, and Brandon Spalding was tabbed as the ODAC's top coach. The Generals would go on to record a fourth-place showing at the South Southeast Regional, where Dolwick, Kinney, Bernstein, Drew Woodfolk, and Cooper Baird all claimed all region accolades. Field hockey went 8-10 overall and 5-3 and in the ODAC, besting Bridgewater in the conference quarterfinals before falling in overtime to Shenandoah in the ODAC semis. The Generals were dominant at home, producing a 7-1 record at the WNL turf field that included an early season upset of 7th-ranked Christopher Newport. Haley Tucker, who missed the first seven games of the year while recovering from an injury, still earned first-team All-ODAC and All-Region honors. She finishes her field hockey career with the third-most goals and second-most total points in program history. Lauren Palano, Caroline Caruso, and Ariel Yabalar joined Tucker in receiving All-Conference honors. And football finished 5-4 and four overall and 3-4 and four in the ODAC. The Generals won five of their first six games before struggling down the stretch, including last-second home losses to Hampton, Sydney, and Shenandoah to close out the year. WNL still placed nine players on the all-ODAC teams, led by first-team selections Mitch Hornsby, Thomas Freeland, and Bo Sheridan. Josh Brees, who set the conference's single-season rushing record during his rookie campaign in 2017, added 1,119 more yards on the ground this year and already ranks sixth on the school's all-time rushing list. Brees received another all-conference designation alongside Sean Clark, Will Corey, Andrew Frayler, Phil Davis, and Jarrett Wright. Additionally, Hornsby was named to the D3Football.com All-South Region third team. For the Washington and Lee Athletics Fall Review, I'm Jeremy Franklin.
Please be seated. I've been asked to begin with a public service announcement. In the unlikely event of an emergency, there's an additional emergency exit at the bottom of the stairwell loaded, located behind me to my right. I welcome you to our Founders Day convocation. Please be seated while the university singers perform their opening selection, Let My Love Be Heard.
Thank you, University Singers, under the direction of Professor Morgan Ludig. We celebrate Founders Day and gather for convocation by direction of the Board of Trustees on the birthday of Robert E. Lee, who served as our university's president from 1865 to 1870. On this occasion, we reflect upon the people whose vision, leadership, and hard work gave rise to this university, in which we take pride and to which we now devote our own energy. We reflect upon the purposes and the values that abide as the common thread connecting the members of this community across the decades and centuries during which so much else has changed. And we reflect upon our motto, non in couches futuri, not unmindful of the future, which expresses our commitment to honor the past, not from a desire to remain frozen in time, but rather as a source of inspiration to direct our own efforts for the benefit of those who will follow us in the decades and centuries to come. At the heart of Washington and Lee University lies the conviction that the future is best served by education. From that conviction grows the communal ethos to devote ourselves to cultivating the considerable potential of our students so that they in turn may contribute powerfully to making the world a better place. The two men for whom our school is named exemplified this ethos in their own words and deeds, as have thousands of other individuals who've sustained the quality, character, and success of this university over the 270 years of its existence. The chapel in which we're gathered this evening first opened its doors to host commencement in 1868. As the first new building at Washington College after the Civil War, it was likely the first on campus constructed without slave labor. Lee had the chapel built to enhance the spiritual and academic life of the college, and it has been in continuous use for 150 years, hosting services, convocations like this one, lectures, and concerts. The chapel that Lee conceived was a simple, undecorated space. There were no portraits, no statues, no plaques. Lee never imagined the chapel would become his family's mausoleum, or a memorial to the Confederacy, which he urged his contemporaries not to erect. This is the first Founders Day to be conducted under the gaze of President Lee. For the last 55 years, since 1963, the same two portraits hung on the wall behind me. The one of Lee, which depicts him in his Confederate uniform, was painted by Theodore Pine in 1904 from a photograph taken during the Civil War. The one of Washington, painted in 1772 by Charles Wilson Peale, shows him as a young man of 40, serving as a colonel in the Virginia militia. It's the only portrait of Washington that predates the Revolutionary War. The paintings you see tonight portray Washington and Lee as they were when they made their direct and transformative contributions to this institution. J. Reed painted Lee in 1866, shortly after he became the president of Washington College. Gilbert Stewart's image of George Washington, which look, should look familiar because it, it is on every dollar bill in your pocket, was painted near the end of his second term as the president of the United States in 1796. That is the very same year in which he made his generous gift to Liberty Hall Academy. These portraits remind us not only of the men they depict and of their integral connections to this university, but also of the importance of our work and of our commitment to serving the public good. George Washington invested in this particular school because he believed that the success of the nation depended upon there being quality education on the frontier. The Blue Ridge Mountains were the frontier, and we were the first institution of higher education to the west of those mountains. George Washington's investment in us was a deliberate investment in the future of the United States. 69 years later, with the nation in tatters after the Civil War, Robert E. Lee accepted the presidency of Washington College because it offered him a chance to contribute to rebuilding the newly reunited states. Putting this small, struggling college on a path to becoming an outstanding modern university was Lee's primary contribution to the future of the country. We continue to serve the public good. Our mission commits us to providing a liberal arts education that prepares our students for lives of responsible, uh, responsible leadership, 
service to others, and engaged citizenship in a global and diverse society. The investments of time, resources, and love that our faculty and staff make in these young people are paid forward by the positive differences that so many of our students, and especially those who are here tonight as initiates of Omicron Delta Kappa, the National Leadership Honor Society, make on our campus and in our community. The work we're doing with respect to our institutional history reflects this same commitment to advancing our educational mission for the sake of the greater good. We're determined to teach and present our history and all of its entanglements with the history of America as well as we possibly can for the benefit of everyone here at WNL and the wider public. Creating a new museum of institutional history will help us research and tell the many stories of this place. It will also enable us to learn from and collaborate with other institutions engaged in the critical work of national self-understanding. We're already collaborating with Mount Vernon, which has borrowed our Peel portrait in exchange for their Gilbert Stewart. One million people per year will see Colonel Washington in his original home where the portrait hung after Martha Washington commissioned it. When our museum here is complete, it will house the Peel portrait of Washington and the Pine portrait of Lee, both of which are important artworks that help us to tell the full stories of our namesakes. But of course, the museum will also tell the stories of other, of other WNL pioneers, including John Chavis and Pam Simpson, for whom we've recently named prominent campus buildings. And we're embarking tonight on what I'm confident will be a long and fruitful collaboration with the American Civil War Museum in Richmond, whose CEO, Christy Coleman, is our distinguished speaker. Ms. Coleman grew up in Williamsburg and earned bachelor's and master's degrees from Hampton University. During her college years, she was a living history interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg, where she eventually became the director of African American interpretations and presentations. In that role, in 1994, she orchestrated the reenactment of a slave auction and played the role of a slave who was to be sold. The event drew national attention and opened the door for conversations about slavery at other historical sites and museums. In 1999, Ms. Coleman became president and CEO of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit. She was named president and CEO of the American Civil War Museum, Civil War Center at historic Tredegar in Richmond in 2008. She helped coordinate the merger of the American Civil War Center with the Museum of the Confederacy to create the American Civil War Museum in 2013. In August 2017, ground was broken for a new museum building at the historic Tredegar site, which is scheduled to open later this year. The American Civil War Museum is the nation's first museum to examine the story of the Civil War from multiple perspectives, Union and Confederate, enslaved and free African Americans, soldiers and civilians. Ms. Coleman has been recognized for striving to make museum experiences meaningful to diverse communities and being an innovative leader in the history museum field. Last year, Time Magazine featured her on its list of 31 people who were changing the South. As the Time article observed, in the South, few subjects are as thorny as the history and meaning of the Civil War. But as CEO of the American Civil War Museum, Christy Coleman has proved unafraid to wade into the middle of the conversation. Her courage also served her well as co-chair of Richmond's Monument Avenue Commission, which was charged with investigating what to do with the Confederate statues on the city's landmark boulevard. After a year of deliberations, the commission issued its report in July 2018 and called for the city to remove the monument to Jefferson Davis and to develop a plan to provide broader historical context for the other Confederate statues. Ms. Coleman's distinctive and impressive professional path demonstrates the value of a liberal arts education. In a 2015 interview with the Richmond Times-Dispatch, she revealed that she had intended to be a lawyer until, quote, my first summer as a living history interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg showed I could merge my talents, academics, creativity, and business interests into a meaningful career. Please join me in giving Christy Coleman a warm welcome to Washington and Lee.
thank you all so much. That was very, very kind. Um, it is a real honor to be with you and to have the opportunity to talk to you about leadership since we are celebrating and commemorating these very fine young folk who have uh, become a part of ODK. So I want to share with you some thoughts about that from a historical perspective. I want to be able to inspire you at some point during this conversation and above all, I hope that I do not bore you silly. So thank you very much, President Dudley, the Board of Trustees, faculty and staff for the invitation to join you today. Now, one of the things as we consider leadership that I've been thinking a lot about lately is this idea is of, of it being extremely difficult to even take on or to even consider leadership roles today. And part of the reason for that is that we live in a time where every little thing you do, somebody has a picture of it. <laughs> somebody has a video, somebody has a recording. I just thank goodness that I grew up at a period of time before we did all that. But the truth of the matter is, when you live in a time with intense social media, self-curated content, and a lacking sense of humor coupled with a gotcha mentality, anybody interested in leadership needs to have considerable fortitude. In times like these, we look to our leaders for guidance, to navigate those difficult moments and seize opportunities that help move us towards a greater good or a goal, whether that is business or whether that is in academia or whether that is in politics, whatever that is, we we often look to our leadership for that guiding light. However, if we, the huddled masses, are not vigilant, we may find ourselves led astray by those whose interests aren't for the greater good, but rather personal gain. This phenomena does beg the question, however, what is a real leader. So as someone who has studied and loves history, especially social and political movements, this question comes to the fore for me frequently. And I'm often asked, well, do you think so-and-so was a leader? Did you think so-and-so was a leader? And I never even, I have to say, when I came into the world of Civil War history, oh my lord, it's a whole nother ball game. But it is one that has stayed at the fore of my thinking. What exactly is leadership? Because virtually every generation asks this question in one form or another. I mean, quite frankly, we study history because we are often looking for some understanding, some little nugget to help us understand what's happening in our contemporary environment. We look to the past for patterns or justifications for our actions. And the bottom line is, history really is about us. What we choose to value, what we choose to hold dear, how we choose to build and make connections as well as community. What that process taught us, however, is that sometimes, well, sometimes people aren't right and we have to step back and we have to rethink things. President Dudley mentioned um, the work that was done with the Monument Avenue Commission. And here's an example of where leadership had to take a different kind of turn. When myself and my nine other colleagues from uh, business and academia and so forth in the, in the Richmond community were asked to serve on this commission, I have to say, I um, thought they have no idea what they're getting into. At that point, I had been uh, leading the Civil War Museum um, for about eight years. And I have to tell you, um, having worked in the Revolutionary Era and the Modern Civil Rights Era and all the different museums that I've worked with over time, there's a special kind of crazy that comes with the Civil War. <laughs> but 
I agreed to do it. I agreed to serve as co-chair of the Monument Avenue Commission. Our mayor, being the young man that he is, thought, well, you guys can have a couple of meetings, you'll write a report, and then you'll get back to me in like, what, two, three months, right? Sure, <laughs> that'll work. So he wanted us to have a deadline of October. I'll never forget it. We, he formed us in June. The idea was that we were going to have this meeting in October, and we'd reveal all of our wit and understanding. And meanwhile, I'm thinking to myself, well, that's great from just you know the, 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 the nice part of my life that I'd like to have back, because I know this is not going to be as easy as he thinks it's going to be. And sure enough, we set about our work. As soon as the announcement hits, there were those who said, they're just gonna take down all of our statues and the radical lefty pinky, you know, are just like ISIS. <laughs> and then there were the other people who said, why do we still have these second place trophies on the side of the mountain, you know? And people were shouting at each other before we had the first meeting. So we scheduled the first meeting, considerably on neutral ground at the Virginia Historical Society, now known as the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. That's where we held the first meeting for the public, to hear the public input on this issue. <sighs> it was fun. In that moment, leadership was needed because people came armed and ready for a fight, and not one person came ready for a conversation. You see, leadership isn't just about populist opinion. Leadership has to help people get to where you want them to be, where they need to be. And so after that first meeting and the chaos of it, we decided as a group that we, we just really had to do things differently. And in that pursuit, we decided that maybe it's better for us to just step back and ask the community how they want to engage. So we did that. We set up separate little subcommittees. We invited the public to come and, you know, no more than 20 or so people would come to these little gatherings. We had a historian group. We had a, you know, if you were going to add somebody to the Monument Avenue, who would it be group? Because bear in mind, Virginia law did not allow us to even consider removal. So it wasn't even on the table as far as the commission was concerned, right? It wasn't on the table. I and mean, we got people who were upset about that too. But nonetheless, we had these different conversations. And the beauty that we found is that when we got people out of the 500 mass of people that gather, because people can be mobbish and clannish and all of those things, when we actually got them into conversation in smaller groups, something remarkable was happening. They were listening. So we decided that our next meeting would try to seize on those moments. And unfortunately, the events, our meeting was actually scheduled, <laughs> our meeting was actually scheduled for August 9th, the second meeting. When we got word of the groups planning to mass in Charlottesville. And we went ahead and had our little meeting and then, and it was fine, you know, people came out, and again, smaller groups. But then on that Saturday, that Friday night and that Saturday, we watched in horror. And again, my co-chair and I, Dr. Greg Kemble, since we've been asked to lead this effort, we stepped back and we said, we gotta do it differently. This can't come to Richmond. We have to do something different. 
And so we made the decision to cancel our next meeting to give us time to figure out a better way to gain public input so that it was meaningful, to find various ways to reach our community, not just the usual suspects, not just the powerful, not just the business interests, not just heritage groups, but everyone that we could reach, every age, every demographic that represented our city. And this is where I am most proud of my colleagues at the American Civil War Museum. Because as I was struggling trying to figure out how best to approach this, the staff said, well, you know, the first thing we have to do is use the resources of the institution to help the community understand this history better. There was no doubt we have an unmatched collection of materials um, from the Confederacy and the South as a whole. Ninety percent of it the public has never seen. A lot of it were the diaries and the writings and the speeches and the planning documents and the various proposals for all of these monuments were in our collection. And so the staff said, you go do that, we got this. And off they went and created a companion website called On Monument Avenue. And we partnered with the Valentine History Center. We partnered with the Virginia Historical Society. We partnered with the University of Richmond and the BCU and everybody that had something in their collection. We created an online resource for the public. What was stunning is that people actually used it. By the time we had our second meeting, which wasn't planned until after the first of the year, over 17,000 people had gone onto that website. The average use, the average time on that website, you ready for this one? For those of you that are media majors and all of that, the average user on the website was spending 17 minutes. That's unheard of. And even more, they were coming back and back and back. So I knew, I was like, wow, okay, this is great. We are serving our purpose because uh, hmm, the bottom line is at the American Civil War Museum, when we said, when we created this new institution, we said that we wanted to be more than the traditional museum. We wanted to be the preeminent center for the study and exploration of the American Civil War from multiple perspectives, and we meant it. But we also knew that we could not be neutral when our communities were in crisis. That was the leadership that flows through our institution, every level of our institution. And so we did. And the Monument Avenue Commission went on with its work. And we got people, set up uh, websites for people to send in their letters and to answer online surveys and queries. And we set up meetings all over town. We allowed different organizations. We said, hey, you know what, you know what we could do? We should go out two by two like the disciples and allow the organizations to invite us to their house. So churches and social organizations and SCV chapters and, and uh, healing and reconciliation groups and we ended up, when it's all said and done, having conversations with well over 2,000 people in these intimate settings. So that when we did finally have the last big public meetings, we actually used little um, electronic voting and clickers to see how people were moving in their thinking about it. And we were stunned that with knowledge, by providing people the records, just letting them see them for themselves, that people were willing to have the conversation that just a few months before they weren't. And for that, I will forever be proud. And yes, there are absolutely those who would not agree with all of the recommendations. And I will tell you that the Monument Avenue Commission report, if you're interested, is 135 pages. And our recommendations are um, roughly six or seven key rec recommendations. But what was remarkable is that when it was all said and done and you asked people what they thought, the tenor had changed. The tenor had changed because people felt like they had been heard. And this 
is the key to leadership to me. When we think about leadership, we think about descriptors such as strong or visionary or strategic and ethical, and hopefully we add in things like competent and compassionate. Equally thoughtful responses may include specific examples of individuals who do, who've advanced in ideology or been able to rise above their own shortcomings to advocate for changes that aren't driven by populist sentiment, but rather visionary ideologies, and this is very tough. It's easy to allow one's charismatic needs, one's own ego to drive your leadership style. It's very easy to do that. History gives us more than our share of individuals who are impulsive, militaristic, manipulative, autocratic, lacked sympathy, or any form of empathy and absolutely were egotistical. And unfortunately, those types of leaders are quite good at manipulating our deepest fears rather than lifting us to our greatest hopes. At various times in our history, our leaders, whether formal or grassroots, have embodied the best of these traits and still failed the test of time or during epic political or social upheaval. And it could be said that their failure was often the result of an inability to fully embrace two very difficult but essential skills in leadership. Those skills are quite simply the ability to be responsive and responsible. There's an adage that suggests that we get the leaders that we deserve. Now, you may not know, but this comes from a French uh, philosopher who really didn't think democracy was such a good idea. And we somehow use this like, you know, this is like a good thing. Oh, you get the leaders you deserve. Uh, well, hmm. The underlying thought with this particular adage is that the notion of democracy at work and all its glory and all of its messiness that somehow we'll still get it right. And no, we don't. Because the problem, the underlying problem with this idea is that it takes considerable amount of responsibility off the shoulders of your leader. Yes? In other words, anything that happens is your fault. It's the people's fault. And they alone have the power to fix it. However, true leaders, historical and contemporary, bear tremendous responsibility, not only to the people, but to that greater good and that goal. They feel responsible for those who've chosen to follow them, and they have empathy for those who question them. Their moral center, whether guided by specific faith or humanistic consciousness, compels them to do the right thing. They find the balance between responsiveness and responsibility. But we know, again, this is not always the, the case. And when we step back and we start going through this cycle, we do this cycle of having to look back at the past to figure out the future. And we look at the past and we figure out the future and we try to figure out what our path is. We do all of this work. And we fail to stop sometimes to really understand why. Why do we do this when it comes to leadership? We do it because we need it. We do it because regardless of modern sensibility, change over time and all of those things, we look to the past to help us figure out what's happening right now. And unfortunately, what happens, what happens is that we, we give the past a pass sometimes. We lift leaders, almost deifying them, which in my mind is really not fair to them. If they have shortcomings, we often do everything in our power to redeem them, choosing to ignore, or worse, obfuscate their failings and shortcomings. Again, without ever really recognizing that by doing so, we are cheating ourselves. 
in the process from valuable lessons. Now, here at Washington and Lee, the namesakes of the university have undergone scrutiny over time. George Washington and Robert E. Lee were absolutely venerated during their lifetimes and absolutely deified in death by many. Both men have been inhaled, excuse me, have been hailed as extraordinary leaders. They are iconic, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> they are iconic and known the world over. However, to some contemporary sensibilities, both men are problematic. And as much as they may be praised for degrees of selflessness, valor, integrity, and competence, they have been called to task on other issues, namely tied up in the, a lack of empathy, the inability to consider the needs and emotions of others unlike themselves. And at the heart of these contemporary criticisms is recognition that both men were responsible for stripping basic human rights and dignity from hundreds of people that each personally owned. Now, I want to say that I worked at Colonial Williamsburg um, at the time, about 20 plus years ago, when all of the nation's founders were undergoing intense scrutiny. I mean intense. I don't think anybody got it nearly as bad as Jefferson. Jefferson still is having to deal with it, and Hamilton hasn't helped him. <laughs> But we look at Washington, which I think Hamilton has helped him. We look at George Washington, and he was this man who actually embraced his own mistakes. He embraced his own shortcomings. He asked us to just bear with him, that we would be kind to him, because, yes, he knew history had his eyes on him. He was known as a brilliant military person, even though the stuff he did wasn't always brilliant. Serving as our first president, keeping us together, keeping us from falling apart. But he was also someone who was, in fact, deeply wedded to the institution of slavery for most of his life. There were 317 enslaved people at Mount Vernon and his related properties. As anticipated, the amount of effort that went into trying to make um, Washington the good master, which is the thing that happened, say, 20 years ago when all this started, this, this reviewing, we have this thing. We want to lessen these moments of these people rather than just let them be who they are in time. I can't tell you how many times I heard it, especially when I was portraying an enslaved person. Is your master good to you? And then, I figured out a really important question to ask the people who were asking me that question. What does good mean to you? And I would get responses like, well, I mean, they feed you, right? Your clothing looks pretty good. You look pretty healthy. So do they beat you? I mean, you know, this is honest questions, right? One of the hardest things to help the general public understand at that time in particular was all of those things that they were asking me really wasn't the most horrid thing about the institution. The most horrid thing about the institution was the fact that a human being was considered property. Any child born of my body, if I were born 200 years ago, would automatically and perpetually be enslaved. Washington, for all of this, growing up in this system, understanding this system, having constant, constant in his ear from his, the abolitionists that were starting to form and, and the folks who were talking about slavery is inconsistent with the ideals of a new nation. All of this, Washington kept it in his head and made the decision to make a personal act. And that personal act was that he chose to see to it that all of the slaves that he owned would be freed upon his death and they would be released upon Martha's death. And, what, and Martha, 
Well, you know, Martha wasn't going to take a chance on that. So she moved things up a bit. But somehow it is more comfortable for us to talk about Washington that he couldn't tell a lie. I assure you he could. <laughs> or that Washington had wooden teeth, which I assure you he didn't. He had ivory teeth for one pair of his dentures. And the other pair of dentures were actually human teeth that came from the enslaved population. These are hard stories. But at the end of the day, the question becomes, is he still a remarkable leader? Is he still someone for us to venerate? And I would argue that he is both. I would argue that Washington, keenly aware, again, of his shortcomings, did what he thought was best in his time. And as we understand this man more and more and more, is it forgiving him for not having sensibilities about what was happening to the enslaved population? Do we forgive him because we know that he, you know, had a very uh, particular set of, uh, of, of rations that he expected the slave population to get? Do we forgive him because he and Martha were absolutely, um, absolutely rigid in their concept that no slave family should be broken apart ever? That he tried to make the best of a bad situation? That sounds good. It really does. He did what he could to keep this 317 people and the wealth that they represented. Hmm. The wealth that they represented in this interesting balancing act. Because I'm sure he was thinking about responsibility and he was thinking about responsiveness. What do I do in my time? But here's the thing, no matter how good he was, that the people, those very people, the reason why we know their names, the reason why we know what they looked like, what scars were on their bodies, etc., was because they ran away. They were seeking freedom and independence too. And so when we're building this national narrative, when we're building our need for heroes, when we're thinking about all of these things, we might need to even further expand how we're thinking about leadership, how we're thinking about that very word. Because the truth of the matter is, again, for all of his extraordinary leadership qualities, consistency, integrity, sobriety, competence and vision. He also knew that he was only human. And we deserve to give him that much back. In his farewell address, which is actually one of the favorite things of, of you know, of, despite the inaugural addresses, the farewell address to me is a brilliant piece of work. And yes, I know Hamilton had a hand in it. But um, he said, He said, it is hoped that he could provide an example to others. He said, I also shall carry with me the hope that, of, that my country will never cease to view them, and that meaning his shortcomings, with indulgence. That after dedicating, and I'm paraphrasing, after dedicating 45 years of his life to the service of his nation with an upright zeal, the faults of incompetent abilities will be consigned to oblivion. When I think about Lee, who is related, I think that as we 
go through this dissection process with him. He too deserves for us to see him as he was, not as we hope him to be, not as we need him to be, but as he was. He was certainly a man of conviction. He was certainly a man who knew how to rally men to do whatever he, whatever he needed them to do on the field of battle. They would go head first. After the war, he is revered by all of being the symbol of the South. He came here to build something new. But parts of him, parts of pre-war Lee, came here with him as well. And as you are unveiling and working on your museum, and I know that we'll be working together with some of the materials that we have to share from our collections, that you will find a far more complex, a far more important, a far more engaging person than the one that we have chosen to turn into a hero. Because there is a difference between a leader and a hero. And we need both. And at different points in time, young folks in particular, you're going to be asked this very question. And where you will stand and how history will view you and your choices and your decisions. They will give you little pieces of time for youthful indiscretion. But it is what you take into your adulthood. It is for whom you choose to make a difference and when and how and where that you too will be judged just like I will. From the moment I stepped into my role, I knew, hmm, I knew that there would be all kinds of questions, all kinds of assumptions. I hope that in the midst of the mistakes that I have made in my leadership roles over the years, far, definitely not on a national scale uh, for sure, but in my little corner of the world, when people are thinking about the things that I've done, I hope that they don't have to say, yeah, she was pretty good, but Instead, I hope they say, she was pretty good, and. Because if we do that, that means that they really saw me. They really saw the things that made me work, the things that gave me passion, the things that made me smile, the things that made me cry, the things that made me angry. And frankly, I think Washington and Lee deserve the same. They deserve the same. So as you go on this work, you have to do the work. And that work may leave you in a place that doesn't fit a narrative you may have grown up with. It may leave you with a place that puts you in a defensive posture where you no longer even want to hear it. But then I would say to you again, it will be you who is failing him in that moment. Either of these men, they all have something to share. They all have something to give. They all have something to be remembered for. So, ODK, leadership, staff, faculty, when you step out of this chapel tonight and you continue your work on this campus, trying to figure out how to reconcile your past and how to keep moving in the future the way your motto requires, I hope that you'll remember some of what I've said with you. I hope you remember to be the leaders that your descendants will look to. I hope that you will leave deciding exactly what kind of ancestor you will be. Thank you so much for your time and attention.
Thank you, Ms. Coleman, for your powerfully thought-provoking remarks, which I know uh, will stay with us for a long time. Founders Day is also the moment when we recognize several individuals for fulfilling the ideals of leadership and service. And we do so by inducting them into Omicron Delta Kappa, the National Leadership Honor Society, which was founded right here at WNL. Rosella Ivana Rita Gabriel is the president of the Alpha Circle of ODK. She's a senior from St. Louis, Missouri, majoring in physics and global politics. She's a Johnson Scholar and president of Amnesty International on campus. She's led on-campus rallies for refugee and human rights and leads a team of nearly 300 student members to educate the WNL community and raise thousands of dollars for refugee and immigrant causes, both abroad and in Rockbridge County. Last year, she was awarded the Christopher Nolan Student Activities Leadership Award and named Student Leader of the Year. She serves as a writing tutor at the Writing Center, a calculus and physics peer tutor, has led engaging lessons for Rockbridge Elementary School girls as the previous physics chair for women in science and technology, and serves as an editor for the political review. She told me she's feeling a little tired this term. <laughs> in addition, Rosella is a first year resident advisor and works through the first generation low income partnership on the new initiatives board, presenting ideas for how to make the campus more accessible for low income students. Please join me in welcoming Rosella to the platform. Thank you, um, President Dudley, for your kind introduction. I would also like to welcome our distinguished guests, students, families, and friends as we gather to celebrate the extraordinary accomplishments of our new initiates and anticipate their continued excellence in leadership, both here at Washington and Lee and in communities across the world. Yesterday, we celebrated the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr as a day on, not a day off. MLK Day is intended to empower individuals, strengthen communities, bridge barriers, create solutions to social problems, and move us closer to Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Here on campus, we've engaged in Care Rock Bridges Community Parade. We viewed challenging documentaries, and we will have heard from several incredible speakers by the end of the week. These are signs that together we are progressing towards achieving Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. Indeed, it's fitting that we're here today to celebrate the leadership of students, alumni, faculty, and community members who have devoted themselves to, leaving, to leading and serving their communities and this nation. But the influence of Dr. King's leadership should not and must not stop affecting us here in Lexington after this week. I challenge the collection of our campus's fiercest leaders before me to take today as a starting point if you've not started already, to take today as the impetus for a shift in perspective in our academics, sports, extracurriculars, and service, to focus not on ourselves but on the other. What can we be doing to make our fellow classmates feel more comfortable at WNL? How are we challenging ourselves to engage with the school's history, and more importantly, ensure that its present actually makes each of its members feel like they are beloved members of our WNL community? How does this very space in which we operate today impact some in our community? And how can we lift up the voices of others around us? Just over a century ago, a select group of 15 Washington and Lee students and faculty leaders founded ODK to bring together leaders involved in the various spheres of college activities for the general good of the institution. Since its founding, the society has sought to honor those students, faculty, alumni, and community members who best demonstrate the areas recognized by the society, scholarship, athletics, service, journalism, and the arts. Many of our initiates excel in more than one of those fields, while others represent incredible depth within a single sphere. At its core, I was raised to know leadership as service. 
I was taught that leadership from ego is frail, that willpower fades when focused in service of oneself. But harnessing the joys of those we serve makes leadership a worthy endeavor. All our initiates today lead in formal, countable ways. But they also lead simply by building empathetic relationships and empowering those around them. I am certain that you, our initiates, will follow the tradition of Martin Luther King Jr. and practice servant, mindful leadership daily. You all have the potential to improve the world around you by serving others through inclusive, humble, and bold leadership. I am humbled by the previous accomplishments and future trajectories of my fellow students and honorary initiates honored here today. We will now recognize each of our initiates through the traditional tapping ceremony. If we could have our tappers on the stage, thank you. I will begin today with our honorary initiates. I will recognize each individually, and I ask that you hold your applause until each have been introduced. Mark Easton has served as head of school at Stewart Hall School in Stanton, Virginia since 2004, and served as headmaster and assistant headmaster at two Virginia schools before that. He served as director of publications, then director of annual giving, and finally associate director of development at the Episcopal High School in Alexandria for 10 years. Eastham is a former president of the Tappahannock Essex County Chamber of Commerce and a former member of the vestry at St. John's Episcopal Church there. He has also been a member of Rotary International and the board of directors of the Virginia Association of Independent Schools. He earned a BA from Washington and Lee University and a master's in education from the University of Virginia. Brant Helwig is a professor of law at Washington and Lee who also serves as the Dean of the School of Law. He received a BS in Mathematical Economics at Wake Forest University and a JD from the Wake Forest University School of Law. After serving as a law clerk to the Honorable Juan Vasquez of the United States Tax Court, he began his teaching career at New York University School of Law. He accepted a tenure track position at the University of South Carolina School of Law, where he was a member of the faculty for 10 years prior to joining the law faculty at WNL. He specializes in a variety of federal taxation topics, including individual income taxation, taxation of business entities, and estate and gift taxation. He has co-authored several case books on these subjects with his colleague on the WNL law faculty, Bob Danforth. After several years on the faculty, he began his administrative role as dean in 2015. Mohamed Kamara is associate professor of French at Washington and Lee. Currently head of the Africana Studies program, he has also served as interim chair of the Romance Languages Department. He has a BA from the University of Sierra Leone and an MA and PhD from Purdue University and Tulane University, respectively. Mohammed's teaching and research interests include French and Francophone language, literatures and cultures with specific focus on African and 18th century French women writers, colonial education, and human rights. Mohammed is also a founding member of the Refugee Working Group and Rockbridge Interfaith. He is the current chair of the International Education Committee, a faculty representative on the Board of Trustees, as well as a member of other university-wide committees. As faculty advisor to campus Muslim students, he is a member of the religious staff in the Office of Inclusion and Engagement. Bucky Miller faithfully served the Lexington community as a police officer over a 30-year career, first as a patrol officer, then as investigator, then sergeant and deputy chief. He has been honored by the Lexington Police Department with the Meritorious Service Medal, the Life Saving Medal, and the Award for Valor. Bucky has been honored for his community leadership as the Lexington Public Employee of the Year in 2002 and the People's Choice Award Citizen of the Year in 2014. 
In 2015, the City of Lexington proclaimed June 10, 2015 as Captain Bucky Miller Appreciation Day. He has been an adult volunteer counselor at the 4-H camp for the last 12 years and has been a basketball coach for the Lilburn Downing Middle School for the last five. He continues to volunteer for many local organizations, including the Rockbridge Area Recreation Organization and the Community Table. He is a graduate of Lexington High School and holds a degree in psychology at, from Virginia State University. Lex McMillan was the 14th president of Albright College. Upon his retirement, the board elected him President Emeritus, the third president so honored in Albright's 161 year history. The board also renamed the college's campus center in his honor and inscribed his name on the college's founder's wall. He served as Vice President for College Relations at Gettysburg College from 1993 to 2005. He previously served at, and was Executive Director of Development at Washington and Lee. He is immediate past chair of the National Velodrome Development Foundation, a volunteer speaker for Fair Districts PA, a volunteer with the Adams Rescue Mission in Gettysburg, and a lecturer and choir member for his church. He is an authority on and gives talks about author C.S. Lewis, and he received his bachelor's degree from Washington and Lee, a master's degree in English from Georgia State University, and a doctorate in English literature from the University of Notre Dame. Bill Shelton served as director of the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development from 1998 to 2018. He served five governors, providing advice on housing, economic development, community development, and building code issues. Bill has served on numerous boards and commissions, and his leadership has been recognized with the Virginia S. Peters Housing Award from the Virginia Housing Coalition, Policymaker of the Year by the International Code Council, the Robert Baker Achievement Award by the Virginia Association of Planning District Commissions, and the Excellence in Virginia Government Lifetime Achievement Award, and others. Bill has been inducted into the Virginia Housing Hall of Fame. He received a BA from Washington and Lee University and a Master's of Urban and Regional Planning from Virginia Commonwealth University. Please join me in celebrating our extraordinary honorary initiates. Thank you. As they return to our seats, we will now turn to honor our undergraduate senior initiates. From the class of 2019, Jeremy Absig. John Ahn. Aaron Ahn. Jenna Hyun Choi. Suzanne Eleanor Ellie Cosgrove. Catherine Frances Dow. Haley Ryan Glick. Lorena Hernandez Barcena. Morgan Van Gilder Maloney. Catherine Sinclair McAvoy. Catherine H. Oakley. Jackson Arthur Roberts.
Anukriti Shrestha. Mohini Tangri. Sarah Trois. Julia Udicious. Jordan Elizabeth Watson. Join me in congratulating our senior initiates. We will now welcome to the stage our junior initiates, the class of 2020. Laura Rose Calhoun. Edwin Antonio Castellanos Campos. Tiffany Bakyung Ko. Maya Kathleen Laura. Rose Marie Maxwell. Brian Christopher PC. Hannah Margaret Witherell. Yue Yu. Please join me in celebrating the accomplishments of our junior initiates. We will now recognize together our third year law school initiates. Joseph Gregory Duchesne. Jacqueline Marie Fitch. Madison Claire Flowers. Mary Nobles Hancock. Sally Elise Harper. Benton Thomas Morton.
Danielle Joan Novelli. Alex Whale Show. <coughs> Joining our third year law students on stage, please hold your applause as we continue to welcome our second year law school initiates. Leilani Tinashe Bartel. Hannah Olivia Klo. Caroline Louise Crosby. Junior Joshua Nlovu. Austin Shizinski in absentia. Let us give our third and second year law school initiates a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much to our tappers, Elizabeth Mugo and Alex Stolwig. And now I have the honor of presenting the Leyburn Award for Exemplary Service to Professor Sen. Ginny Sen is a member of ODK and a professor of economics at Virginia Military Institute. She has a PhD in economics from the University of Mississippi, and she holds a master's and bachelor's degree from Calcutta University and West Bengal, India. She is the winner of the Distinguished Teaching Award at VMI and the Thomas Jefferson Teaching Award. She is the co-advisor of the Building Bridges Service Club at VMI and the chair of the Committee on Academic Advising and Support. In the community, she is a founder and board member of 50 Ways Rockbridge and chairs that organization's racial issues justice group. That work includes the Coming to the Table community group to forge better race relations and an education program for all middle school students to learn more about Jim Crow and Confederate monuments in a Lexington Rockbridge context. She's also active in the Immigration Rights Issues Group and the LGBTIA Plus and Women's Rights Group. She is treasurer of the Foundation Board of Rockbridge Regional Library and has served in leadership roles with the RCHS Parent Teacher Student Association and Woods Creek Montessori. A nomination letter for the Leyburn Award cited Professor Sen's great humanity which takes the form of secret acts of generosity she practices daily. We'll now present the award. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations once more for each of our award winners and initiates. We will now return to our Founders Day programming with President Dudley. Thank you, Rosella. And on behalf of the Washington and Lee community, I offer congratulations to all of the new initiates who exemplify the ODK ideals of leadership through service, obligation to others, and individual sacrifice. To our new initiates, please take a moment to look upon the accomplishments of the honorary initiates. Take inspiration from them and set your sights high. We will be watching with great interest as you continue to grow as university leaders, as well as leaders in your professions and in your communities in the years to come. Would all please stand as the university singers perform the Washington and Lee hymn. We will be adjourned upon its completion. Thank you all very much. <laughs>